Welcome to another episode of the Hoops Fix podcast with me, your host, Sam Nita, full-time British basketball advocate. And on this week's show, we have none other than Jesse Sazant, originally Canadian. Well, I mean, he's still Canadian, uh, but moved over to England uh, from Canada in the uh, year 2000 after having done three years uh, under Dave Smart at Carlton University, the, the most successful powerhouse program. And as he describes him, a god in Canadian basketball um, so that really grounded his philosophy in coaching uh, and then come over here and, and has focused his efforts on the club Ken Crusaders, which he's now a director of and essentially runs things uh, down there in the, in the southeast. Um, has done a lot of things uh, in basketball and has kind of been involved with uh, many projects that are uh, focused on growing the game and trying to improve the game, uh, which we get into in this. Me and Jesse work very closely together on the academy leagues uh, when uh, initially went under the, the rebrand into the EABL, WABL and, and ABL. Um, and he was also involved with the basketball development model, which we get into in this as well, which was a project from Basketball England to tr- try and really uh, change things and push things forward. So I love these conversations, uh, conversations around sort of growing the game, changing the game, improving the game. And uh, we kind of got to go into that as well as obviously his story and his, his coaching philosophy, his background uh, and his focus. Um, He's been involved in national teams, uh, headed up the England Under-15 development program for five, six years, was an assistant with the England Under-16s, um, and has really been sort of at the cutting edge of, of, of various different basketball projects um, in the UK. So, yeah, we're super interested to talk about uh, that and, and the comparisons between Canadian basketball and British basketball. So I feel like it's a conversation that you will get a lot of value from and enjoy. Uh, as always, before we get into the show, please take two seconds to check out our Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash hoopsfix, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash H-O-O-P. PSFIX. There you can sign up to give us a monthly or annual contribution of as much or as little as you would like to help us do the work that we're doing. We're not asking for a lot of money, literally talking about the price of a cup of coffee. Um, it goes a long way in helping us do what we do and help grow this British basketball media landscape thing. Uh, as always, if you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment below. Let me know what you think about what Jesse had to say. Um, you can reach out to me on every single social media platform at Hoopsfix. And if you prefer some one-on-one uh, feedback, uh, interaction, drop me an email, sam at hoopsfix.com. Anyway, that is enough for me. Uh, here is this week's show with Jesse Sazen. Jesse, welcome to the show. Good, <laughs> pleased to be here. Uh, yeah, really, really pleased to be asked. Humbling to be asked. Um, appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, as I will, I will explain in the intro for people that are listening. This is a take two. Uh, we obviously tried yesterday, and I had a technical issue. Um, so we're going to go again and, and try to make it as natural as possible. But uh, I'm sure it'll be fine. And there's obviously a lot, of, lot of interesting stuff to talk about and stuff that we didn't get to yesterday. So yeah, uh, starting as Sounds always, um, we'd love to go back to to the beginning and kind of your your starting basketball, how you first got involved with coaching, um, and obviously the roots in in Canada. Okay, so. Uh, short version, grew up in a, in a small town in Canada, um, played from a young age, so kind of even growing up in a, in a really small town, there were central venue leagues from when you were kind of seven, eight years old. Um, so played through that and it was kind of a, a very culture of giving back. Um, so lots of with the younger teams, there's lots of the older kids who, who would help coach. My dad was involved, helped running it. And so got involved coaching some of the younger groups when I was kind of 13-ish and kind of fell in love with coaching pretty quickly and, and enjoyed that side of it. So I kept playing through high school, but coaching more and more became the path I was following uh, to the point that my last year of high school, I coached my high school team instead of playing for them. Um, went to university. Um, first university I went to, Wilfrid Laurier University, uh, had first thing I did when I got accepted was obviously call the coach and, and line things up. So was a team manager as soon as I got there, uh, kind of spent every day uh, living in the basketball office, uh, got promoted to assistant coach the year after that. So at, at 19 was was assistant coaching at, at university, um, transferred universities at, at the end of that year. And uh, through luck, through being in the right place at the right time, through hard work, uh, got invited to come help at Carleton's basketball trials. Uh, through the previous coach that, that I knew from growing up. And that was the same time that Dave Smart came in and Carlton. So uh, I kind of joke that if I'd known more about Dave Smart, I probably wouldn't have done as well as I did. That, that by not knowing him, I came across as a, 
uh, as confident, kind of spoke up my opinion as, as a very young coach, but who we should keep and who we shouldn't and so on. Uh, and what I did obviously worked because Dave then asked me to be involved and, and to stay involved as um, as an assistant coach. And that's where that's where my coaching career kind of really took off for me. That That's where a lot of what my philosophy is now be, became embedded. Um, and so, yeah, so that was kind of my path through to, to starting to get involved with coaching. Uh, again, for, for context for people like Dave Smart, like who is he? What's his background? Like why is he uh, who he is? So Dave's basically God in Canada basketball. Um, Dave is one of the best coaches in the world. There, there, there is no doubt about it. He took a, a program at Carleton that, that wasn't very good, that, that was struggling to a, a perennial powerhouse. Um, they've won 14, uh, 14 of 16 national championships in, in his last 16 years with them. They have beaten numerous Division One teams, uh, including, you mean, beat Wichita State the year they went to Final Four, uh, beat Baylor the year they went to Elite Eight. Um, so ha- have ter- has turned um, Carleton into this um, internationally known program. The There's more import players uh, from Canada and Europe from Carleton than there are from everywhere else combined as far as Canadian schools. The, the senior men's national team is basically NBA guys and Carleton guys now. Um, so, uh, yeah, on every level, um, seen as as a uh, the elite coach um, in Canada. And then when you talk about sort of that laying the foundation for your own philosophy and, and sort of coaching style um, moving forward, like w- what were the lessons? Like what were the things that you took away from you know being up close with him for for a period of time? So, kind of answer it two ways: the one on a personal level, and then one as far as my coaching philosophy. So. Uh, personally, Dave had the biggest impact out of anyone on, on who I am as a person. Um, he, the the lessons he preaches through basketball are things that apply to everything in life and, and have formed who I am, really. Very much along the lines, uh, the biggest and simplest way is the whole uh, not being a victim, not... Uh, not focusing on what's around you that you can't control, but but controlling everything within your life and controlling what you do next. And uh, I kind of laughed that, that some of the buzzwords from the last 10, 15 years that, and phrases that have become popular about mental toughness, about control of the controllables, even it was 25 years ago I started at Carleton, and that's all that we talked about. And um, so very much something I've carried forward through through every part of my life is how to deal with things and how to deal with setbacks and how to deal with failure and how to deal with things outside your control. And it's, this sounds very normal. Lots of coaches talk about this when I'm speaking about it, but what separates it is the the level, the consistency um, that it's done with, that this was every single day, you never could have an excuse for anything. Every single day, the highest level of expectations were there for you. And it's the, the degree that it's done with of those things and the drive of those that really impacted me as, as a person, I'd say. And then from a, a coaching philosophy, the, there's a couple of things. The, the idea of what competing is and, and really getting guys to understand what being competitive is. So we keep score at everything. There, there's a consequence for everything that we do. Um, but it's then the teaching that happens through that. So... There are lots and lots of players in every part of the world that will describe themselves as competitors. But they're the same guys who sulk when they miss a shot, who don't necessarily work hard on aspects of their game, who don't like defense or don't like rebounding or don't like these things. We confronted that very uh, overtly and and made very clear that if you're being a competitor, sorry, if you are a competitor, you can't do those things. If you do those things, then you need to stop describing yourself as a competitor because you don't care about winning and losing because you're not willing to do those things. And very much getting players to understand, and it's different for every single player, what what those aspects are that they need to address if they truly care about winning. And, and that word care is something we've used all the time and really talking about what caring means as far as your actions. And it's not what you say and it's not what, what you talk about and whatever. It What you do every single day shows whether you care or not and what you think of the people around you. 
Um, so that massively um, played a part in my coaching philosophy. And then the second thing I'd say, more uh, tech tech wise, we were very, very simple in what we did. Um, the whole focus was we do one or two things extremely well with a counter to it and nothing else. And that applied through all, all aspects. So whether you're talking about tactics and systems, we the first national championship we ran, we ran a wing ball screen every possession and, and had one set play. And that was it. That was our entire offensive package. But we knew from that wing ball screen, however they defended it, we knew every read inside out. We knew where the opportunities were. And the guys could, could read that to, to the highest level. Um, from a, a technical point of view, our guys did not have six dribble moves. Our guys knew they needed to have one right-handed and one left-handed dribble move and the counter to it that they knew inside out and that they could read that defender exactly in every situation to know whether to use the counter or not. And it was just about getting one thing and repeating and repeating and repeating so you knew the read inside out instead of having six things you were pretty good at. Um, so that, again, ha has been something that uh, has carried through my philosophy, my coaching philosophy to this day. And, of course, the, you know, the other thing that Dave is known for is his demeanor, uh, you know, <laughs> whether you want to call it uh, confrontational, aggressive, or uh, I don't know the best way of describing it, but um, he is he is the kind of coach to, to get in a player's face um, and a lot of screaming and shouting. Like, you know, I guess observing that is it ever too much uh or do you think that that it's kind of necessary and the players understand that it's it's for their best interest okay so i uh, i mean uh, i said this to you yesterday but uh, insane is without a doubt the word to use he is a another level when, when that whole caring stuff i was just talking about his level of caring is um is a whole other level from anyone i've ever met i mean he every detail he cares about and what he cares about most and why he comes across in the way you see is people not fulfilling their potential and the level of care he has for those players and coaches because it, it was the same working for him with, with that intensity is phenomenal um and it's why in that environment he's in where you're working with players for at least a season but quite often for five years all the guys who played for him are so so loyal to him and that uh Every summer when I go back, they're all there. And guys from 25 years ago who were or weren't successful with basketball are still drawn back to, to the program every summer because the part they played in, in their life and who they are. And you see you see the confrontational, you see the craziness in games, um, but what you don't see is what goes on behind the scenes with that and how much all of it is about trying to get players to understand what fulfilling their potential is like and to really push them to to be the best person and best player that they can be um so in the context he's coaching in do i think it's it's too much no uh because the the guys who come are buying into that are knowing they're going to be pushed beyond their boundaries and and that's what they want and it's done with a huge level of care behind it it is not just the this stereotypical old school coach that that what you see is what it is and it's just being a being confrontation all the time that there's a lot that goes on behind that that makes it work and then bringing it full circle and tying it back into to, to british basketball of course he there was a, a period where he was the the gb under 20 head coach and and that you know i, I spoke to him at that's euro camp i can't even remember the year that it was but um and you know he he basically said that it was a it was a, a uh, a failed experiment so to speak that it just didn't work because there were potentially differences in in cultures and uh whether it's the the, the british players not necessarily used to that that demeanor like what was your understanding of kind of um that situation his involvement with the, with the gb under 20 program and i guess where where the expectations were unaligned and and, and kind of where it went wrong okay so um you mean part of it being blunt i got it wrong you mean i'm who obviously sent him the the app the the idea of applying and well we, we talked many many times about um the differences in culture you don't it's hard to fully appreciate it till you see it so so i probably a had underestimated how well he understood the the differences that there would be and b probably also underestimated how uh, difficult it would be to change things in a short in, in a relatively short time window that he had 
And I think there's, um, in hindsight, there, there's mistakes on on all sides with it. I think um, the the squad was trimmed down to 14, 15 people before he even arrived, um, before their first practice. Uh, you know, with Dave, there are going to be a few people that are going to walk out the door. That that is that is a given at that level. Um, so not having a, a deep enough group of players and the right types of players that could have been those ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth players in the national team that would have thrived in that situation. Uh, some of them were tried to be brought in late and whatever. Once a few people had gone, and and so that that didn't help. Um, when you're dealing with a coach who everything is driven by that culture and your best player is parachuted in the day before the tournament, having just been cut for the men's team. You've now got Devin with a really strong personality, Dave with a really strong personality, and they've had a, a day or two of practice before they're, they're in this competitive environment to get on the same page. So I think that was, was never going to work. Um, and, and I also think, I mean, and it's, it's fair. It's what we do as coaches. You're judged on results. Um, when they beat Croatia, they, uh, I think it looks like this experiment is working very well. They lose a one or two point game to, I can't remember, I want to say Finland, but that may be wrong. Um, that means they don't progress. That's a one or two point win. And the experiment's probably talked about differently. And um, and things kind of fell apart, obviously, once once they were out of the chance to win and get promoted and stuff like that. But that's not, if you're playing in... A meaningful quarterfinal, things don't fall apart in the same way necessarily. So, um, yeah, fault on all sides. There, there were lots of things that could be done differently if, it, if in hindsight. But um, yeah, unfortunately, it didn't work out. It's safe to say. Do you, do you think that um, the sort of the the young British player mentality is just not cut out for that level of I don't know what you want to call it accountability slash uh confrontation because they're just it's just not something they've ever seen before yeah it, it's it's a whole variety of levels um it's still the biggest thing i get my head around from coaching from home to here and i've, I've been here 20 years now um the the depth of talent makes it for, it's, to me is the number one thing that makes it difficult and it's it's not just that style of coaching it's accountability in, in general because I talk like coaches in Spain, we talk about the same thing and so on, who, are, who have a, a very different philosophy and how they coach in general. We could set these really high standards for players because if it wasn't right for guys and they didn't want to play with that level of accountability, we had a lot of guys behind that who were a little bit, who were a little bit worse, but not significantly. And because they bought into culture, six months later would be better players anyways. Um, I mean, we typically have 100 kids try out for under 18 team, and we would cut to 12 after two or three trials, and, and that would be our team for the year. Um, whereas here, I mean, I, I coached that same philosophy when I first moved, and you mean, our, uh, Ian Harris, a, a common friend of ours, played for those teams. We, we finished the year with six kids, because when kids didn't want to play with that, there was nobody queued up waiting to join my team. I had, I had everybody who wanted to play. So if someone walked out the door, there was nobody else so you then all of a sudden have to to adapt to it. And I think we, um, whether you're talking about national teams, club teams, everything, I think we, um, we allow talented players to get away with way too much because we're, we're, and I'm at fault as well, because we're worried about if we lose that player, there's not enough talent behind them to f fill that gap. And the drop in talent is... Uh, I mean, like Steve talked about um, last week in the podcast, the, the top 20-ish at Dang, there, there's a clear separation between every year, whether it's 12, 15, 18, 20, but there's a real drop-off. There's not 50 kids walking in realistically with a chance to have a really good week and be ranked out in the top five at the end. That There's a group of those kids who have no chance walking in. And... Uh, and that's, I think, that one of the toughest, toughest things to really move that forward is how do you hold that ultimate accountability knowing that if players don't want to do that your club may then struggle or your national team may then struggle because the losing one or two players both uh, PR wise but also realistically losing one or two of those talents guys national teams may kill your chances in the summer because they're just not that depth of talent.
so yeah, I think accountability is a is a massive issue for us in British basketball. But it's taken me twenty years, and I still haven't figured out the answer of of the way around it. Yeah, I was going to say, like, how do you fix the depth from? How do you fix the depth problem? Like, you know, how do we get to a, a position where you know we've got five, ten guys at each position, and and if if you know one of them drops out or one of them gets cut or whatever, you've got the next guy ready to 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 kick in, like. What do you think? Uh, are there easy wins that, that potentially the federation or, or us as clubs could do to, to help um, grow the, the breadth of talent uh, that's available? Yeah, I think that there's two things for me that um, are important. Both are difficult, like both will take time, but but are important. Um, younger kids, everybody talks about, and the fact that everybody talks about it and we still haven't cracked it also shows how difficult it is. It's not as simple as saying you should work with younger kids and, and that's, that's the quick fix. Um, there's, uh, I mean, even if I look at our club, we only started mini ballers properly because my kids wanted to. And so I know there was a gap for it along, but we never did it until there was a personal reason to, to do it and stuff. So um, yeah, get, getting kids played younger, without a doubt, before they've chosen their main sport, uh, for for lots of reasons, is something that, yeah, I won't really go into, because lots of people have talked about your podcast, everyone knows we, we need to get younger kids in. The other thing, though, I'd say is, with the accountability thing especially, and with trying to develop elite players, being clear about what different competitions are for, what clubs are for, and, and kind of what that structure is. And it's it's more to me about what you're trying to achieve with each of these levels than it is talent necessarily because over time the talent will then follow uh, the, the structure so we uh, one of the biggest things when I moved here that that surprised me like we would practice six days a week at home with with our best under 15 16 17 18 kids and there was talent with like there were 13 14 year olds I was seeing when I moved here who were talented but on three hours a week, we're never gonna gonna make it. And some of those kids didn't want more. And that if you'd offer them six days a week practice, they wouldn't have bought into it because that's not what they were looking for. Because that's not the the traditional culture, or basketball is not their their priority, or so on. So, being able to create an elite structure of clubs, uh, whatever the number is, that parents know signing up for these clubs is about elite performance. And you are going to be expected to practice and play five, six days a week. You aren't going to miss practice because you're revising for a GCSE. Your parents aren't going to pull you out of practice for a family event. That if you're signing up to this, this is elite performance and this is elite development. And uh, those clubs are putting structures in place that allow their players to develop in that way and, and are bought into that system. You then have a, a competitive level below it. Where again, similar to what we have now, basically, clubs are going to practice a couple times a week. It's going to be a good level. The stuff will be well organized. It'll be about a. There's still the, the the fun side of competition for under 16, under 18 kids, but we're not pushing you in that same way. And so, if you like basketball, but it's not your real drive at, at this stage of life, uh, there's something there for you to play. And then, obviously, some sort of grassroots level. Underneath that, that, that's about fun and participation, and we're not going to practice much, and we're just going to play a lot, and which is important as well. But I think creating a structure where you have more kids, and the academies have st have done this to an extent at, at that age, but it's too late, really, um, with, with that age group, where you've got more players who really understand what elite basketball is, and then you've got a much bigger pool at your under-16 national, national team level of kids who get it and kids who who could come in and uh do a reasonable job at national team level that um that you've got a, a much bigger bank of those kids who have come through these programs when you talk about um essentially defining which club plays which role and who are the elite clubs who are the sort of mid-tier and who are the grassroots do you think that has to be federation led like is that the only way something like that would work uh Probably, but not necessarily. I think federation-led and defining the standards, because I should have said that as well with, with the tiers, being clear about those tiers, let, let coaches and clubs decide what they want to do. Because again, there, there's clubs who are successful, who, who have talented players coming through, who do a good job for what they do, 
But if you said to them, you need to run practice six days a week and you need to provide all this, have, have zero passion or interest in that, which is, again, is totally OK. But if they know what those parameters are, they, they kind of pitch for the right level. Um, I think the one of the reasons it, it needs to be federation led, from my point of view, is there's a lot of experts in British basketball. That there's a lot of people who think they know what's best. And I think to get buy in. I think it would be hard without it being regulated because I don't think there's, as I was say, many people, I don't think there's probably anyone in British basketball with a, a strong enough voice right now that, that could pull people into this with in, in the way that, that you would want it to work. Um, so in that way, it needs to be federation-led, but I also think it needs to be um, jointly led by the community, and that's where... The concept of the BDM, which, which kind of never... Which is the basketball uh, development model. Yeah. So, so the concept of that, which never ended up developing into anything, of these groups that were jointly the federation with a variety of experts from a variety of backgrounds outside of the federation talking together, I think something along those lines is probably the way to make it happen. Um, because I think it's... Uh, there needs to be community buy-in, but there needs to be, if you're going to get nationally to this point, it needs to be regulated and it needs to be driven driven through the federation to, to force teams to, to to follow along. Well, the other option that just sort of came to my mind is, is, is potentially like the Pro League, right? It's like, well, actually, if, if, if um, well, you're pro, you're, the, the BBL is the top top tier, right? So, yeah. so ultimately, if they wanted to, if the franchise has decided, okay, well, this is what we're going to do, we're going to really focus on having the entire pathway covered. We're going to have the academy, we're going to have the, the junior clubs and whatever. Uh, and then it could become clear that actually, well, okay, well then these, you know, what is it, eleven, twelve BBL franchises uh, are going to be the the elite clubs, and everything else falls underneath that. Do you think it could be uh, BBL led? I think I think it'd be if you're talking about starting at like with 14, 15 year olds, I think it'll be tough because you're not you need a wider base, I'd say, than eleven or twelve teams. Um I think you're not talking about kids going residential at that stage of life. So geographically you're then ruling out big parts of the country of, of being able to, to, to do that. Cause I think something that that if you look around the world, what's kinda happening a lot within elite basketball is this idea of keeping the pyramid broader, not narrowing the pyramid as quickly as we do with stuff. So I think, could you potentially have a an under 18 and under 20s model driven by BBL teams where kind of where the academies are now and, and flowing through in, into under 20 or under 22 or, or however you want to label it, having a real pathway there linked to the, the pro teams? Yes, 100% you can move to that model. I think for under 16s, you would still need a club led model with with a wider geographic base with more than 11 or 12 programs doing this because then you mean by definition where we're talking about a bigger base for the national team and so on well for under 16 you're down to 12 programs that are really producing these elite players not all the kids are going to be top age and so on so you've got only an 80 to 100 player pool to start with for, for potential national team guys. That that gets pretty small pretty quickly. So yeah, I'd say yes, under 18s upward, probably not under 16 and below as far as being through the pro teams. The, the other thing like that has just come to my mind as, as we're talking is, and I, uh, you're gonna have to forgive my ignorance because I don't know that much about Can Canadian basketball, but yeah. um, when, you know, when we compare British basketball to, to American basketball, obviously Americans, uh, well, when you talk about development, it's, it's much more education, educational institution led. I feel like Canada is similar to the UK in the sense there's this hybrid model between clubs and, and educational institutions. I, yeah. Is that correct? Like if you were to talk about sort of the, the lay of the land in terms of uh, yeah. what Canada is, how Canada develops players, what, what the sort of the pathway is between, uh, you know, where they're playing, who, who, what competitions they're playing in, the mixture between clubs and schools, how, how does it actually work? So yeah, so probably the, the reason Canada's developed, there's two different aspects, I'd say. So the, the structure first, with what you asked about, is probably halfway uh, or somewhere on the spectrum between the European model and the American model. So school sports are a big deal uh, uh, in Canada still. Kids will play for their high school. Um, those high schools will be a variety of levels. That, that very much, like in the States, 
there's very few schools that can recruit. So it is you go to your local high school and some are traditionally good and some traditionally aren't at basketball. But all those high schools will be practicing two or three days a week. Um, so at, at your school, you will have every high school at home will have a gym that you I mean, I went to I went to a high school of 400 kids and our gym is better than any of the things we use as a club um, right now here. So every school will have a good facility and that you'll practice multiple times a week. So you're getting you're getting reps and you're playing regularly. The school season ends earlier than it does in the States. And you then have your club season. So with with our club teams, that's where I talk about having the 100 kids try out and so on. Our club teams, we, we go kind of four months a year would be just club. So during the high school season, we practice like once or twice a week and do skill development. And their focus was playing for their team. But again, we're still practicing twice a week. I'm saying just twice a week. That's what I get with the guys here now. Um, and then once once high school ended, we'd go every night. Um, they'd get one night off a week and then we'd play tournaments the weekend. And kind of similar to AAU, but it's not... Um, I say it hasn't been corrupted by shoe money and prestige in the same way. There's definitely elements of that in Canada now. And as Canada basketball's grown, that, that's kind of come across. But it's still that clubs were much more what we define as clubs here compared to AU teams where it's just guys fly in, we roll out the ball and, and we play on the weekend. Um, so like all my all my best coaching memories outside of Carleton at home are the, are the club team stuff because you'd be with the guys six days a week you'd be traveling to tournaments together you'd have all this time on the road together in hotel and it's just uh and I guess that's the other thing that that makes it very different to here there's no defined levels by the um clubs aren't defined in levels by the federation but all the tournaments you go to are labeled and there's kind of like four tiers and so this is this is a division one tournament division two so again, you as a club put your kids in the right competitive opportunities. Again, so the teams, the te the tournaments we go to growing up and the, the with the small town or whatever, we'd be playing against people at a similar level, and and kids are getting the right level of experience. The the we'd be going to obviously all the highest tier things with um with Garsman with with the Carlton Feeder Club. So it it lets you find your level, and it lets we'd with guardsmen we'd play every single weekend in a tournament and parents knew when they signed up this is what this is what we're about this is elite development we're going to play every week some clubs might go to one or two tournaments a month and again that's what those parents have signed up for and that's what they know they're getting so again parents are able to choose with with their children obviously the right level of competition for them and to find that that um not so much competition, the right level of ambition of, you mean, back to that accountability bit of, am I really pursuing this in elite level and this is, has to become the number one priority in my life or is this something that lets me play some basketball for fun and and I know what, what I've got. Um, so I think that, that structure works. Um, but I also think when you talk about the growth in Canada basketball, the... The biggest thing that happened, and so you mean Mike McKay, Don Smythe, who are both uh, obviously well known internationally, drove started a program based completely around coach education, and um, twenty they 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 wrote their goals twenty odd years ago when it started, um, saying things like being top ten programs in the world, whatever, and it looked ludicrous having having NBA players. Uh, having a certain number of NBA players and so on. And at the time, it would have been crazy. I mean, when I was growing up, the Canadians, the NBA were, I mean, Steve Nash was just coming through, Rick Fox with a loose connection to Canada, and, and there wasn't a lot else. Um, and the coach education they did and the buy-in that they then got from the community. And again, this whole, uh, as we talked before, the, the two-sided approach, some regulation, but some working with the community to get buy-in and this so that it, you can increasingly grow the regulation and expectations because now most people believe in it and have bought in. Um, what they did with coach education and coach development was, was massive. And you not only now see the Canadian players in the NBA, you see Canadian coaches in the NBA. You see Canadian coaches getting high-level opportunities because they've been invested in, and it. And by doing that, you get both. You get 
the, the level going up and you get players coming through because they're being worked with with high level coaches um so so yeah i'd say those are kind of the the big differences i was going to say that that you know when we're talking about uh, basketball on a global stage and countries that have um experienced massive growth and success in the last two three decades like i feel like it's fair to say that canada is probably the country that has had the biggest progression uh in terms of you know everything that's that's happened and kind of where they where they were and wh- where they are now do you think that is purely down to this coach education program that you're talking about obviously the other thing that we hear is the vince carter effect and if you know the the impact that, that vince carter playing in toronto had um but when, when, when you sort of i guess from from your point look at what's happened uh, and that progression what do you think it's down to uh, what do you think were the key drivers in, in making that happen and i guess the reason I asked that is that obviously you know we're here in the UK. We're in a we're not in a great situation basketball wise, and uh, yeah. in twenty years' time, we'd love to be in a situation where we're a lot better than we are. Um, what are the takeaways that we could potentially apply to British basketball uh, from from Canada's success? So I think you mean the the first part of the question. It's those two things combined because you can have lots of people playing because of Vince Carter doesn't mean you're going to be any good. We're, we're probably a good example of that. You've got a lot of kids playing. Um, so, but at the same time, you can have really high level coaching, but working with a very small base of players and a very small base of, of physical bodies that are, that are NBA type bodies. And there's a, there's a limit to how much you're going to, you mean, Finland's a good example of that, where they've done amazing things with their national program. Players are much higher level, but there's not an explosion of Finnish guys in the NBA because ultimately there's only so many guys with, with the body type and so on that are going to play at that level. So I think it's it's the two things combined that um, the the explosion of players that came from Vince Carter and the popularity of basketball uh, alongside developing this coaching program. I think the takeaways uh, for us are, are a couple of things are about understanding the the balance the carrot stick and the balance of that in that in being able to get clubs and coaches to buy into this there needs to be an equal amount or a balanced amount of incentives to, and and by incentives, I mean spending the time getting out there talking to coaches with good, with good research, with good evidence to be able to convince people what we're doing is the right thing to do and to get people to buy, because any change people will be reluctant to. So having the, spending the time to work with those networks to, get your early converters who are then buying in and selling it within their communities and and to really work with that side. But at the same time, to be willing to stand up and go, this is the direction we're going and slowly increasing those standards each year. And when people rebel against it, being strong enough to go, this is the way we're going to go. And it doesn't matter if you have talent player X at your club this year, because, okay, even if very cynical, but but you have to look at it at, at, uh, at leadership levels, even if there's three or four players in this generation we lose out on because we're going to stand up. We know those players aren't going to leave that club and therefore they're going to be left a little bit by the wayside. Next generation is not going to happen. And in the long term, this is going to be far better than trying to softly, softly be in between the two, but never really make a stand on anything and nothing really changes. So if, uh, uh, if a university coach in Canada wants to coach his son's under 18, he's not qualified to right now because he hasn't done the qualification for that age group and he can't do it. Because again, a good university coach means nothing. I mean, I coach mini ballers now. It definitely was not my skill set to begin with. It's it's completely different. So, you mean, you cannot coach any age group or any rough age group or rough ability level in Canada without that specific coaching qualification. And those qualifications are not the level two here and a tick box and whatever you mean they are detailed proper qualifications which again i know they're moving towards that would be trying to make them more more rigid and so on but um so i think the the lesson really is and when i you I mean we we talk to people from finland basketball we talk to people from germany we talk to people from canada who are all kind of similar type countries for what you're talking about that that develop their basketball culture and, and their ability and all of them were the same thing. Comes back to coach education, but it's the two things. You must get buy-in and work with people, and 
you must gradually raise the expectations though and these are non-negotiable what would you say about the state of coach development in in the uk and i guess the just the overall standard of uh, of coaching uh younger coaches coming through like um well do you think it's good do you think it's bad like what do you think needs to be done if it needs improving like i guess just a, an overall sort of big picture take on it um yeah, i don't think it's great um uh for a variety of reasons some easier to fix some are are genuine big problems uh that are genuine complicated problems it you I mean it's something i'm passionate about and you I mean you can see through through my time in the uk the the young coaches we've worked with at, at national team with and and especially at crusaders that have gone on to do things and i think it's uh there's a variety of of challenges um that I don't have the answer to all of them, but but some of them I feel like we're, we're well placed to do. I think the young coaches' expectations and expectations of young coaches is a really difficult one here. So if um, if I look at if I look at myself and the path I went in Canada, yes, I was quite young when I got some opportunities. But I put in four or five years being an assistant coach at these levels before I got those opportunities, and you couldn't walk in to um, see so me. Even like I said, go, going to to my first university, being free labor because I'm a student, being uh, having done a lot of coaching at that stage, my first year assistant coach, I spent most games stood behind a video camera and and filming the game because that that's one of the things assistant coaches needed to do and stuff. And you earn your dues and, and you, you work your way up. Now, there's two things that from a, a learning point of view, it was fantastic. So as far as my development as a coach, I got way more from that than if I'd been given more responsibility. Because I spent time with these high-level coaches, spending every day with them, learning from them, seeing what they do, talking to them, going to have a drink with them afterwards, picking their brains, and really being exposed to far more than what you get from a coaching clinic that because you're seeing it in real life with real players and real situations that happen um so the the challenge we have here kind of linking back to that is i think we expect too much of young coaches in that as soon as you're any good you're head coach of a national league team because none of us have enough coaches and it's not because we're, we're trying to be difficult or whatever but it's um it's the pressures we all face the club it means people don't get that opportunity to be an assistant coach and to learn. So when when Troy Cully was talking to us about coming to uni here as his coach development, the, the first thing we told him was, in your first year uni, you're not coaching any team. Your goal is to get to as many practices as you can with all of our coaches. And that's for your first year, we're not going to give you any responsibility. You just need to, to learn. It then leads in to the second point, and Troy was fantastic with this, but lots of young coaches expect too much. And um, the I genuinely believe for uh, a mid-level coach, the UK is one of the easiest countries in the world to be paid to coach. So everyone who complains about how difficult it is, A, the way that the, the, the fact that the education system is basically privatized here and that all these schools have this money, they, that doesn't happen in most places in the world. So all this primary school coaching that people make money out of but also from an elite point of view like through the academies and so on there aren't jobs like that in canada there aren't jobs like that in spain you mean you and the competition and if there are those jobs the competition for them is ridiculous because you've got so many high level coaches who all would love to make their living out of basketball so you get a lot of young coaches here not willing to work hard, not willing to put the hours in because they go, I'm not being paid for it. I mean, I was outside of working camps in the summer. I was in my second year at Carleton before I ever got paid to do any co any club coaching. But I'd spent five or six years to that point coaching six days a week, coaching every evening, coaching every weekend, because if I wanted to make it to the point where I could get some money, that's the work you had to put in. And if you weren't, just like players, if you're not willing to put the work in, you're not going to make it to high levels. So I think um, we have a, 
a, a big challenge with young coaches, both in can we give them opportunities to learn and real opportunities to, to assist and coach, to work with coaches and so on, but also can we do better? And the same we talk about players and accountability. Again, in their expectation, be realistic. If I'm going to be an elite, a genuine elite coach, not somebody who's looked at as okay in England, as in somebody who actually could go and coach somewhere else, somebody who could coach at a high level, Am I willing to put the work in? And are we showing them that they need to put that work in to to develop? Um, so I think that's the the young coaches. That's the biggest thing to, to me. And then I'll, I just think there's such a... I think this is less on the federation, in fairness, with older coaches outside of the regulation stuff we talked about. There's not a community of coaches in the UK like there is in the other countries I've coached in. I mean, especially Canada, but also Spain, Australia. There's not, there's pockets, there's friends that people have that they obviously talk to and so on within the coaching community. But there's just not, there's a lot less collective buy-in, collective basketball discussion. Um, yeah, not even buy-in. It's, it's the discussion, you mean. Like at home... If I had free time, I'm going to watch someone else's practice. I'm going to watch someone else's game. That, that I'm, and then we're going to have a drink and we're talking about it and so on. And, and I took so much from that as a young coach. But it's not – but the people I was doing weren't all young coaches. This wasn't all just your development stage. This was ev – everyone I knew in the coaching fraternity at home, their social group was coaches. And, and they spent so, so much time just learning from each other, talking to each other, um, and that's, uh, I mean, I have people close to me know, I've talked about this a lot, that's the bit I miss from home the most, is there just isn't, there isn't that outside of people's own clubs. We have that at Crusaders really well now, and I'm lucky that I, I work with a great group of coaches, and, but it's one of the guys in our club, and, and you don't have that kind of across multiple clubs in, in the same way as, as we do at home, in, in my eyes at least. Makes sense. So... You did three years uh, assisting at Carlton, and, and of course, then you, you ended up coming to the UK. Like, what led you actually coming to the UK? That was in year two thousand. Um, and then, I yeah. guess looking looking back uh, on that now, can you remember clearly in your head uh, sort of the your expectations coming in, the biggest potential surprises that you had when you landed in the UK, and the differences between you know British basketball and, and Canadian basketball? Yeah, definitely. Um... So I, I came over here to train to be a teacher. So uh, getting in teacher's college is really hard at home. Um, and uh, I probably hadn't focused as much on my academics as I should have because I was a little bit focused on basketball all through university and spent most of my time in the basketball office. Um, so uh, there's a company that recruits Canadians to, to come over to do teacher training. So I was coming to, to do my teacher training here. Um, I mean, we joke the, the small club that that existed that ended up becoming crusaders i got to canterbury at, at one or two o'clock I, I was at practice at five o'clock um that uh that obviously had again been my first priority when i knew i was coming here to find out what was going on um yeah it's uh it blew my mind is <laughs> is the the uh because again i'm i'm in my early 20s at that stage i'm i'm still pretty naive as far as world basketball because don't forget back then uh, internet existed, but there was, but it's it was text based. You're, you're not watching any clips from from anywhere else and stuff like that. There's no social media. There's none of that. So, you mean to me, I've I've coached a high level in Canada. I've been down to the states, loads of AU stuff. This is what basketball is. Like this is what basketball is going to be. And then I rock up to practice, and it's a cement floor. Um, it's non. The, the rims aren't sprung back. We've got some rims on the side, which is great, but they're mounted to the wall, basically, so you can't do anything competitive with them. And uh, and the the players don't know anything, and, and there's no there's no competitiveness and stuff like that. So, again, part of that that joke we talk about is, and it's genuine. I got cracks at five, and by three minutes past five, I'd lost my mind on the kids and been like, "You guys don't have a clue how to work hard." Um, so, um, a bit of a cultural shock. Yeah, <laughs> definitely for me and them at that moment. Um, but um, uh, so facilities was the first thing that that just shocked me. That how bad facilities were, how hard they were get access to, and how expensive they were. Um, 
you mean we uh yeah you mean so so that side of it the amount we practice which is obviously linked to it so you mean what what we would charge kids for a guardsman is was to practice these six days a week in good quality gyms to go to 12 tournaments because all that was factored in the price to go to 12 tournaments a year and hotels and everything else was less than we charge kids here when I'm coming across to practice three hours a week on a cement floor. Um, so the, the obstacle of, again, we know the issue is they need to practice more, but how you fix that's really difficult because A, it's culture. These kids haven't grown up and parents haven't grown up with practicing means we're going to practice every day and, and how much time you're going to give up and so on and stuff like that, but also how you actually make it affordable um, with the cost of facilities. So, uh, Court access, court quality were, were two of the big shocks. And then just the, the professionalism. Um, I mean, when, when we kind of sidetracked a bit, it's probably the best way to explain it. When we were talking to um, Canadian players to, to come potentially play pro for Crusaders, when we were at, at the time when we were bringing imports in all the time, my opening line to them always was, it's professional basketball, but it's gonna be way less professional than what you're used to. Um, because that, that was the reality. Um, and even like I'd forgotten about some of it till on, on Steve's podcast last week and talking about like you have a change room which has it which has a lock on it like that's just at at under going to a tournament so we would we would go to 24 team tournaments and we would never have our bags on the bench because there'd be a road of all the change rooms and you knew for each game this is the change room we're in this is where we're putting stuff and this is like and I don't even mean with guard, this is with like the low level tournaments. That's just what you did. And so I've got somewhere to talk at halftime. I know where I'm doing my pregame talk. The players put don't have to pack their bags and stuff like that before they come on the floor. It, it just, so all that side of it. I, I even remember my first year going to a game and um, like we've got our warm up. I'm used to camp. We've got our warm up time to the second. This is when we do this. This is when we do that. And the home team saying, oh, the first game finished earlier. So we're going to tip 10 minutes early. And I'd like lost my mind because I'm like, how can, how can, no, we've timed stuff. Like this, this is how basketball works. You don't just kind of roll the ball out. And so, yeah, so, so that the professionalism was the other thing that just shocked me of how, um, unprofessional, unscientific, un, yeah, that it was, um, at that stage. Do you feel like a lot of those things in the, in the two decades that you've been here, do you feel like that, uh, some of those things have, have progressed in any type of way? Or do you feel like we're, we're still, if you were to, if you were to, take yourself then come over from Canada now, you would still have the same shocks, the same surprises. Um, yeah, some, some has moved on without a doubt. Um, I know we'll talk about academies later, but academies of, of if I came from Canada and walked into academy environment, there, there's five to 10 academies definitely walk into and there'd be some shocks, but it wouldn't be anywhere close to, to that kind of stuff that, that, that there's a lot of them that are very professionally run, uh, high quality, high expectations, et cetera, stuff like that. So I think uh, within the academy stuff, definitely. And and that then cascades out. So because of that, because of, of the impact they've had, I think they're definitely, I mean, facility cost is still an issue, but there are more and more good facilities that people can access at, at reasonable prices in, in certain places within the country. And obviously the, 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 the clubs have started building their own facilities and so on. So, so if that's moved forward, still an issue but move forward uh parents expectations of of what it is again in pockets has has moved forward um still ways to go but it's better and then like i said profession <clears throat> professionalism i think it, it depends where you coach and so on at, at certain levels in national league it's definitely the exact same um with teams who are competing at premier high level and so on um, and in, but it, but there's less of those programs, I'd say, than there were um, 20 years ago, for sure. So your your mindset, like you you come over here. So originally, the, the club was at that point was called East Kent, Kent Crusaders. Um, were you thinking, you know, I want to obviously you're doing your teach training as well, uh, so we can't forget that. But but were you thinking, okay, you know, my my plan is to continue developing as a coach. Ultimately, um, that's the pathway that I want to take. Or were you at that point thinking, well, you know, the career is going to be teaching. This is going to become a side thing. Like kind of what was your actual approach to it all? Yeah, the, the second one. I, I thought about it a lot when I was in Canada and um, 
because when I finished uni, there were, there were two routes. There were uh, go into a career or go to the States and try and get coaching jobs and work your way up and whatever and stuff like that. Because again, like I said, in Canada, there's not the number of paid jobs that, uh, that, is, that is realistic. You need it. If, if I was going to stay at Carleton, there weren't full-time assistants at that point and stuff like that. So it, it was, I would need to have a job alongside this to make it work. Um, and just on a personal level, I just chose that I didn't want the the life of a pro coach where you're living season to season. You, you never know when a job's going to, when you're going to get fired, when things are going to change. You're never necessarily going to settle. You're always kind of looking at that step. And so, um, so I chose the right thing for me with, with stability um, and and being a, a bit more secure. And I think... I think that that's a very personal decision for everybody, and, and and it's it's right. There's no right or wrong. Different people go different ways. Uh, on reflection, I, I don't regret any of that side of it. I think the because I think what what I found is that well, I love the when I was doing the men and uh, stuff like that. Well, I love the the tactical challenge of of some of the higher level stuff you can do. Actually, my favorite bit of coaching is working with those 16 to 19 year old type kids where all the stuff I talked about I got from Carleton that I can pay that forward and, and that they're at a stage of life where through elite basketball I can impact their lives moving forward by by using basketball to teach lessons that are going to make a difference in in whatever they do that's the most rewarding part for me that that's the bit that's the bit I like the most type thing so so yeah so I'm happy I went that route um, in the end and then before you kind of decided to focus your efforts with the Crusaders. You did a, you did a short stint uh, with the East London Royals. Um, yeah. I'd be interested to kind of hear your reflections on that experience. Of course, uh, you're working with Humph Long, who's, you know, rest in peace, like legend in the game. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to kind of hear how, how that was as an experience, like what your memories are, and I guess what, what the learnings were, if any. Okay. Just one, one small thing before I say that, just because I feel bad not giving him credit. So, the club was called Kentbury Jazz at the time, run by a guy named Jay Gifford, who's awesome, who's still a, who's still a good friend to stay, whose kids actually come to mini ballers now uh, as the next generation. So that that us becoming Crusaders was me being fed up of being asked if I was in a music group when I'd wear a Canterbury Jazz shirt um, that that had no connection in any way. So that that was a quick change after the first year, and, and then we kind of rebranded and, and went from there. Um, <laughs> East London was was an awesome experience and an eye opener in, in lots of ways. So I that was my third year um, in England. So I'd had these two years where trying to coach, still very much uh, being stubborn and not adapting my coaching style. Going, I can make this work here, but like I said to you, we finished the year with six players. So so I go, okay, if it's going to work, it's not going to work in a small town. It it needs to be a, a bigger pool of players. Um, so Chris, Chris Morgan and Humph um, invited me to come join East London, which I thought was a, an amazing opportunity to, to work with that level of player and, and to try and impart it. Um, it was a, another culture shock for me. So going from we will have 12 players on our team and no more in the gym to having 40 under 16s and 18s mixed together in a one court sports hall for practice. And, and that's all. And that was the only practice we had. Um, and so Humph and Chris as people were phenomenal. They were very, very good to me. They gave me opportunities. Uh, Chris gave me my first national team opportunity as part of being there. Um, and the, the care they had for the young men in that gym and that care, whether they were the superstar or the 40th kid who was never going to play a game, but came out every week was phenomenal. And, uh, you mean they they're heroes for the number of young men in London that they played a, a real part in in their life success from a basketball point of view it was, it was a, a very different um, philosophy in, in how we should do things and um, you mean don't get me wrong the way they did things obviously worked for a lot of people because there's there's a number of kids in that year I was there who are playing at high level so Joe Ickenman was there Albert Margai, David Ajimobi, uh Richard Pettigrew 
who am I missing? There, there's going to be someone I've forgotten now that that's played at, at a pro level from that group. But that's just from, you I mean, the one year I was there with, with that one team I'm working with, it, there's those kind of kids. Um, but it was, it's the only experience I've had in my time in the UK where I thought you really could, I, if I was a, a head coach of a team and had practiced by myself, uh, that I could coach how we coached in Canada, a few kids would walk out the door and that's fine because there's the depth of talent that's there and you could really, really push some of these kids on to, to the way we push kids at home. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm still in my mid twenties at that point. I'm not as, as, uh, emotionally intelligent as I'd hope I am now, whatever with it. So, so yeah, I, I found that tough. I, I found that side of it tough just because it was, uh, I mean, I keep, going back to it you spend three years every day with Dave and you see the success it has it becomes hard to believe in anything else and to, to not to, to not do that knowing what outcomes you can get so yeah so I, I did find it difficult to only stay there for one year um, and uh, and chose to move on because just well I think the world of them as people as coaches we just weren't on the same page um, how much of an advantage do you think clubs have that are in London or the big cities, uh, you know, having that just the sheer number of kids, access to the number of kids because of the dense population compared to, you know, being in somewhere on the outskirts a little bit more? So I think 15, 15, 20 years ago when I was at East London, huge advantage, still an advantage now, but less so. And this is why back, back then there were a handful of genuine elite clubs in London. So you had East London Royals, you had Hackney, you had Ealing in West London, uh, you had Brixton. And those were kind of all the best players. Um, I guess Towers were still a little bit at that point, but but almost all the good junior players were going to a small handful of clubs. So uh, whereas now there are so many clubs in London at who either are at premier level or close to premier level and, and aspiring to that. But the problem now is, yes, I've got a big base, but you see how much the kids jump around. So if, if I really get on you at practice today, the problem is by next week you might be at another club because you didn't like that. So fine, I'll, I'll jump ship and, and go somewhere else. Um, so I think that the talent base is an advantage, but just the sheer number of clubs that are there and, and the opportunities for kids it's also a lot harder to to pull all the best kids in an area together in London now, and that um, and it's harder to to develop that accountability because they they can just kind of go where they choose, uh, rightfully so, because they're not being paid and so on and stuff. But um, yeah, pros and cons cons within it, I think. I don't know if you listened to the Jack uh, Mayevsky podcast, but he was basically saying that there's no incentive for for clubs to develop players because of the fact that you know you put all this time into a player and they can just up and leave. And there needs to be some type of, um, I don't know what the, what the word is, legislation put into place that, so that you know you you're ultimately signing a player and they can't just go and transfer to another club without you know uh, certain ramifications. Do you think that that could potentially work in the UK, or do you think that, like you just said there, you know, if you're not playing players and you're not providing level of provision, it's very hard to do. Yeah, see, I, I'm, you know, I'm Canadian. I'm too nice. That that's 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 uh, that's our stereotype, isn't it? I I, I see it very differently because. Um, okay, so on a, on a selfish level, I see that wholeheartedly differently because the kids I've developed that have moved on, we we got nothing for Ryan Richards, and nor should we have because we never spent any money on him. I have someone who is who life for for his life shares every success with me, and that play a big part in his life, and know that he's had a a much better. Um, he will have had a much better time in this world because of the impact I had on him. And that that's far more than any financial reward. The the kids who come back who are twenty five who are a teach who are a teacher and saying, I use the lessons that from playing from you every day in, in what I do or are in the business world or in whatever, that that's the developing people bit to me. That's not the financial incentive I get. And it's uh, I don't own them. I haven't spent any money on them. I've they've I I feel uh, I feel honored that they've chosen to trust me with their development. And in fact, the kid who plays me for a couple of years and moves somewhere else because they don't think it's right for them, I think they're right to do that. Because if it's 
I'm lucky. Like I say this all the time to kids. I get to coach for 50 years. So if this year doesn't work out, that's fine. I've got next year's group. And I, you get one career. In no way am I going to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. You you do what's best for you. And if playing for me is best for you, great. And if not playing for me is best for you, great. You make that choice because you get one shot at this. So, no, I think, uh, I think outside of academies, because, again, academies are investing a lot of money in these kids, then I think... Uh, and and we've had a situation with FIBA where we were paid for one of our academy kids who left because it's it's recognized we'd invested in them. Unless we have put money into a kid, we shouldn't be getting financial reward back if they choose to transfer or whatever, stuff like that, um, it is my belief. Fair enough. So after your year at Isana Rouge, you kind of then made the decision to, to I guess, focus on the Crusaders. Yep. Um, how, how were you approaching that? Kind of what was the what was the grand vision? Like, uh, you know, you, I assume that you, you made that decision. Okay. Long term, this is where I'm going to be. This is where I'm going to build a base. This is what, this is the club that I want to grow. Uh, yeah. What was your mindset? What, how were you approaching it? What were you thinking about as you, as you went back to focus on, on Kent? So, uh, again, being more emotionally intelligent now, I'll, I'll, I'll put this writer up first at the time I coached girls, um, at home in Canada, coached elite women. Uh, but at the time I, we focused only on the boys side and the men's side, which, which, probably would have done differently in hindsight and we're now doing now but uh so at the time it was about elite development of boys and men so we weren't interested in grassroots there were lots of local league clubs around kent and and there were opportunities for those kids we wanted to get the best kids at under 14 under 16 under 18 and develop them as players to pursue further opportunities we wanted to have a semi-pro men's team that they aspired to and that was based around kent players with a couple of professionals brought in to, to support it and uh, to be leaders in, in kind of people development is how we phrased it. So as far as players, as far as coaches, as far as any uh, wider staff we work with and volunteers, that our goal as a club was to develop people to allow them to move on to opportunities further in life um, from there. You became a director of, of, of the club in 2003, right? So it's like at that point, kind of, had you like essentially taken the reins and it was like, this was your thing now? Yeah, yeah. So, you mean, when even in, in the two years I was there before going to East London, I kind of had, um, because it was a very small club still at that stage. And then the year I went to East London, a couple of parents took it on for the year. And then when I came back, uh, the the biggest thing I did, uh, Lorraine Dagger, who I think the the absolute world of, who has done fantastic things with national teams uh, as well as with us, was her son was was playing junior basketball in Kent at the time, uh, and the the two of us talked about an opportunity to kind of pull together the the elite things that were happening in East Kent, to build this pathway from from under 14s through to men, and. Uh, it was her involvement that, that allowed us to really do that with her connections locally, both with with local league and kind of the, the politics and the, and the history of stuff, but also her relationships with different coaches. And so uh, very much everything we did from, from 2003 for the next 10, 15 years at least and, until we changed tax a little bit as a club was the two of us together. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, so yes, that, that's the point. We did it, uh, but it very much was the two of us uh, collectively doing everything through through everything that we did. Did you have aspirations to potentially have a BBL club at the top at that point? Yeah, yeah. We 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 at that stage, just aspirations. A, a few years down the line, we did some work on it and some financial modeling, and and had um, never never as in close as in we're about to apply, but kind of got the stage of having a three-year plan of what we needed to do to three years down the line be at a stage to apply um and stuff like that uh so yes it, it is something we looked at and a few uh, a few things that may have come off that that may have made it possible at different times um as well do you, do you think kent could support a bbl franchise um possibly uh because i think the, the venue would have been the tricky bit, and that's where we nearly had something come off that, that would have solved it, um, that also would have been 
opened a lot of doors for different revenue streams as well um, within it. But uh, I think where Kent, with things like uh, cricket, with things like hockey, where, where they have teams consistently in, in the Premier League, that because there aren't a lot of big foot, that, I mean, Gillingham's the only the only football team in Kent c- competing in any of the the, um, the national tiers. There's opportunities for those kinds of sports in Kent to get a bit higher profile and to uh, uh, commercially open up some doors for them. That uh, so I think yes, there there potentially was, but the right the right investor and the right venue being alongside it were key, which became close to having both at one point at the same time. That that kind of fell through, but uh, yeah. Wow. So in, in amongst all of this, early 2000s, you would have seen a, a, a young Ryan Richards who, you know, I'm assuming would, it's fair to say, is the most successful player to, to come out of Kent. Um, yep. Yeah, I would love to hear that th- those that, that sort of early reflections when you first saw him, whether it was obvious at that point, the sort of the level of talent he had and kind of the, the memories that stand out from his early development. Yeah, for sure. So um Ryan, as he said on his podcast, t- turned up and kind of was playing locally at just some some turn up and play sessions. Thanks to his, to his brother and um, being a basketball player, uh, Ryan turned up at one of our sessions, um, to which one of our coaches very quickly rang me to say this this huge kid's turned up and I think you should have a look at him. Um, and so that's the first time I heard of Ryan. The first time I actually properly coached him was with the the regional under thirteen team. So I took this the southeast under thirteens knew of Ryan by that point so I so got in touch with him to come to come try out um for that team um obviously knowing that his level uh and so that uh so that was the first time I coached him and it was like it was it was a three four month program leading up to tournaments coached him a lot uh he would drive him to everything so we, so we became very close very quickly um as a young player he could do the difficult well from before, that's nothing to do with me he his fadeaway that he loves now he shot that as a 12 year old and uh and we still joke about it constantly of of me trying to take it out of his or not take it out of his game from do it far less often than, than he chose to when he's got somebody eight inches shorter covering him um so yeah his his upside was clear from the start and uh that ability he had great hands and that's always with bigs that one of the the tough, uh, one of the natural things in general that that isn't a teachable thing, um, and so we talked a lot very early on that if he could get the basics right and he could learn the game, that that he had huge upside. And the other thing with it, he was he was big as at that under thirteen tournament, but he wasn't huge yet. So like. He was probably six two when we went there. Whereas, like, I remember coaching against Kingsley at that, and he was like six eight already at, at that stage. And it was kind of between fourteen and sixteen where Ryan really shot up, and and then you started to have an idea of of what he could be um, because of having genuine size al- alongside the skill set that he had. Um, so he played, I think, another year for one of our for our junior teams after that. And then where things really picked up with Ryan as a as a 15 year old, 14, 15 year old, uh, he played for our men. Um, so he, he played for one of the junior teams alongside it, but was playing for our men. We at that stage, uh, we had a a six foot ten Canadian import who was a league all star in Canada that he that Ryan was practicing against every, every practice, um, who played a big part in Ryan's development, and. Uh, but at the same time, our our men. That you mean? This is me in Canada mode coaching. They 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 didn't treat Ryan like a kid. They practice was practice, and if you, if you don't practice hard, there are consequences. So that they're not gonna. <laughs> there's self preservation involved for them as far as how they treat him. So, um, and this is when everyone found out about Ryan, and um, he touched on it a bit in his podcast. So I know he won't mind me saying, like we had a. There was a point where he had multiple teams from London on the phone to him constantly saying, come play for us. He had everybody um, everybody telling him how fantastic he was. And he has this Canadian coach who just basically criticizes him all day, every day, and tells him everything he's not doing. And um, 
Ryan's work ethic can vary as as he jokes about and stuff like that. So we this this is still a um, one of the proudest things I am and how it turned out. But I still can picture I sat down with Ryan and his mum uh, outside outside practice, just sat sat down and had a chat and basically said, "Look, everyone's telling you how fantastic you are. You have all these opportunities." I'm fed up of you being inconsistent at practice. I'm not going to watch you waste your talent. Like if all these people want you, by all means, go. Like you have my blessing. If you're going to stay here, things need to change. And this this is what the expectations are. And I didn't think the conversation went. I, I rang my assistant coach saying Ryan's done after that um, after that talk and said we he won't be back. Um, and Ryan rang me that night and basically said I'm in. Um, and that on all kinds of levels was a turning point for us from a trust level and, and the stuff he's talked about since as a pro, uh, as far as his trust in me doing what's best for him instead of what's best for me in these situations. Um, as far as him then buying in and for that next year was like challenges like every player, but as far you mean, all the stuff that was happening before wasn't an issue before. He was at every practice. He was competing every practice. He, uh, he, and the second half of that year, uh, like I, I remember it so well at, at D, I think we're D3 then, but he, he'd sub in, he'd score the first couple of times he touched the ball and then some senior men's player would knock him to the floor that, because they realized that he's not, He's a kid, but he, he might be pretty good and, and that they need to and, and people would rough him up. And that's and our guys were very protective of him. And but he you mean as a 14 year old, Ryan played five, 10 minutes a game and and scored five points a game for us because that he that's what I mean, the difficult stuff. He could do well right from the start and, and was able to to compete. And that's the season we then had. Estudiantes, Gran Canaria, all starting to get in touch and, and look at those opportunities um, that led to him going to, to Gran Canaria the next year, um, which, which again, we were a big part of and, and fully supported. That was the, we're, well, we're very explicit with him, Mom, this is what you need to do. He, he needs to move on now, and, and that's the right thing for him. Did you, did you feel at that point that he's a potential NBA draft pick? Like, when you talk about the ceiling for his talent at that age, like, was it obvious this guy could go all the way? I uh, I don't think my knowledge was good enough to know that he could do. I think it's when he went to the when he got invited to the hoop summit, is when that really really hit home for me. Um, that he had that he had like high level pro potential was yeah when he when he went uh, without a doubt knew that, but it's also um, I think I've always been very grounded with. Um, we get caught up in in potential and we remember the guys that we spotted with potential that make it there's a lot of guys that get labeled as as that potential um who, who come nowhere close and like ryan's talked about in a way because he was drafted by the spurs and, and everything that happened ryan is an under 16 national team player there's 20 guys who have performed similar to him at under 16 national team and, and so i think we we glorify some of, as in collectively we glorify some of the memories of the guys who made it versus you mean um i'm not gonna name names it's not from those guys it's not their fault they did it but they're yeah. guys with huge stats and under 16 who that was the pinnacle of their career um so yes there is potential but there's the reality of there are a million things over the next five years that that will play a part in determining how good you actually become when you look at how his career has panned out like you know, there's no doubt that he is NBA level talent, and I think many people would, would would and he even would say that he should be playing in the NBA. Could have had a, a lengthy career in the NBA. Like, I guess, what, what's your assessment of that situation? Uh, do you feel like uh, he reached his he's reached his potential as a player? Do you think that um, he should have had uh, time, you know, in the NBA um, playing against the best players in the world? I I, I think I, I think there's two parts to it. And um, uh, I find it quite difficult to talk about one of them, but it was all, I'll, I'll go through it, but without necessarily the detail. Um, did Ryan make some choices he regrets? Of course he did. And he's, he said that on, on his. And um, 
so by no means do I do I think uh, Ryan's a victim or whatever in what I'm saying. Uh, and and but Ryan was taken advantage of by multiple people at, at different times at a at a developmental age, uh, and um, it's part of the realities of elite sport. Unfortunately, it's the the reality of if you are talented. People will gravitate towards you, some with the right intention and, and some with, with personal agendas. And there's some people who, who used Ryan to further their agenda in a way that I feel is is, is very, very unfair of a, a child, which he still was at, at that age and so on, that, that played a part in where his career went. Um, and I think there was a... Yeah, and unfortunately that's a a key five year ish stretch as far as both as far as your development as a person, but as far as your basketball potential. Uh, and all of a sudden Ryan was at a point where now coming back to the question as far as NBA and stuff, where potential isn't what's looked at anymore. You're now at an age where we look at who you are as a player uh, and Ryan was, hadn't fulfilled his potential at that stage and, and then had to do a lot of work to, to build that back up. So I think I, I think the biggest one the the year he was at the Spurs doing his rehab when they looked after his surgery and so on um, that next season was big if he was going to make the NBA and and that next season didn't go as it should as he as he told the story you mean when he was on here he needed to stay at one club for the year and didn't and and that's the bit that that's what I mean it's not all I'm not only blaming these other circumstances Ryan made some choices that that hurt him as far as making the NBA but I think there's some stuff before being drafted that uh that made it very difficult for Ryan to trust people um in, in those initial steps of his pro career so I'm aware of time here. There's a lot of stuff I want to talk about. We haven't got to. Uh, so there's, there's, just seen the time, yeah. yeah, there's, there's two, two two big things. Uh, is academy leagues obviously. Um, you know, you obviously have your your, your own academy at Canterbury, um, and and then of course there was the the formation of the Elite Academy Basketball League ABL, uh, rebranded so to speak. And me and you worked very closely together on that for, for a number of years. Yeah. I guess starting with like academy basketball in general like you know from from the the point that you started so what year did you start canterbury academy 2009 no it's 2007 so i went there in 2009 but we started a small we started one with uh with some other guys coaching in 2007 okay so i guess what difference is uh having an academy made to your club what what role do what roles do academy what role does academies have to play um, within the development of players? Like, what, why is it something that you know many clubs aspire to have? What is the difference between uh, having an academy compared to not having an academy? What does it allow you to do that maybe otherwise you wouldn't be able to do? So, I- impact ridiculous, um, huge, huge impact, and probably at at two stages, I'd say, at two different two different uh, areas. The, the initial pull, so we were one of the first academies um, after that kind of, we had Durham and, and West Knotts and Sonia, that first group that was really early. And then as academy started to become popular, we were, one, we were one of the earlier ones. And the drive at that point was what I talked about before with practice time. Like the, what's driven me crazy since I moved here is we don't get the hours with our kids. All of a sudden I get the kids on court every day and it's affordable and it's not costing us anything to rent to rent gym space and stuff like that so so back then when academies were we weren't recruiting outside of kent in any way we didn't have residential we didn't have the the coaches were players from uh players from our men's team to begin with and, and then i obviously joined it um it was but just that physically being able to get them the repetitions and playing every day that made a huge difference and uh, um, so that was the on one level, and and uh, if you want to follow through that, we can. But the, the other level was then staffing, and so when we shifted the emphasis to going, we've said we're people development is our priority as a club. Like I talked about at the start, well then the the academies aren't about jobs for men's players; they're about coaches. And so once I had joined, and then the next year we brought James Veer in, that 
uh, and then the path that that has followed and, and all the the high level coaches we've been able to uh, both work with as far as what they already brought and, and the experience they had, but then also to play a part in their development and what they moved on to uh, is huge. So if, I mean, if you look at the the track record of of our coaches, you've got uh, James Veer, Troy Cully, Craig Nickel, Adam Davies, Billy Beto, Christina Stenchucha that have all come through or are now part of our program involved at high levels. All of them were able to, to be full-time professional coaches because of the academy. And, uh, and so back to what we talked about with a chance to develop, they were paid to coach where they're not a head coach, where they're able to assist and learn, but make a living out of it to then progress on to, to whatever, um, both selfishly for us, but also for that's just our academy. There's obviously all these other academies for, for wider British basketball, that's I think the the two big pluses that have come out of academies: regular practice and high level coaches being able to, to work with these players. And at, at that point, in terms of in terms of the competitions, like you were competing, obviously, you know, my knowledge is is very much around the EABL because that was what I was involved with. But before the EABL, what what essentially was the EABL was the I, I'm sure it was called something like the EB BCS under 19 premier men's schools competition maybe dynamic was in there somewhere as well like i'm, I'm not even sure yeah. but it was very long-winded but what, what was the what were the comp what was the, the the state of the competitions and um kind of the the, the levels that, that that you were competing in so it, there, there were two uh, or three but, but two really um we we were one of if not the first to convince AOC, so I don't think it was called AOC at the time, but whatever it was, the, the FE colleges allowed us to play in the league. Um, so we we had the, the the basketballing EBB, whatever, whatever, the competition, which was usually basically a knockout, um, maybe a couple of league games and a knockout. But then through AOC, we were able to compete in one of their leagues, um, and again, we're able to put us in in the highest tier to begin with. So so able to get so we we get. I feel like it was I don't know five to ten games from a league from them, and there was a cup for that as well. So um, so we were able to play against the some decent competition, not loads of games, but still some good competition. And that was 2009, 10 at least. Uh, I'd say my my first full year at Canterbury, we were definitely in those and, and playing in them. Um, and so yeah, so we had those those two things that we were competing in until until we until the EABL was established. Now the the EABL like was it ultimately uh, it came to be because of the fact that there was obviously the ACE program, which uh, is it's government funded, right? Is that how you describe it? Like government funded, uh, and it's for sort of elite players that are on that are on a, a, a pathway to ultimately ideally being professionals. Yeah. Um, and if you were on ACE, it was it essentially meant that you got a certain level of provision, right? So you would get physio, uh, time, contact time with coaches, strength and conditioning. Um, I think there's nutrition lectures in there and, and on all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and the idea of the, the, the ABL ultimately was that, well, actually, if this is the, this is the best provision that a young player is going to have, uh, all of the top young players should be going to EABL schools. Um, because that's the, that's what's best for them, uh, and it's what's best yeah. for the development of the game. Uh, and the idea was let's, let's rebrand rebrand the competition, and ultimately what that will mean is that that uh, well, ideally you're not forcing the kids to go. The kids want to go because you've got a competition that that, that is is pulling them in. Yeah. I'd be interested. In, you know, you were involved. I think was your official title like the chairman? Was it was it chairman like back then? Yeah, trying to remember that commissioner maybe convener yeah. something. It, yeah. Um, Commissioner, I think, is what it was, but yeah. So you were kind of like overseeing it. And again, I think one of the, the nice things about it at that point, and again, I, because I'm not involved as much anymore, I don't know whether it's still like this, but was the, the fact that it was very much club club well, club school program driven, right? It was uh, it was very much the decisions that were made around how it was going to be run was was done by the people that were actually playing in that, that competition, what, was in, what they felt was in their best interest and stuff. I guess I'd be interested in kind of hearing your take on on the sort of the formation of it uh, and and why it worked uh, or maybe why it didn't work, what the, the the problems that it potentially had, and then I guess the progression over the years <laughs> to kind of where it is now and maybe um, where potentially it's it's gone wrong or I, I don't feel like it's fulfilling its purpose in the same way that it was originally. It's definitely been diluted. There's a lot more teams involved. Uh, 
yeah, I'd just be interested to kind of hear your, your sort of overall take on it. Okay, so um, I think that the starting point would be the, the ACE program was phenomenal for one big thing from the start. So I talked earlier about the, the lack of the community of coaches that, that we have in the UK. And those ACE days to begin with were phenomenal because it was all, a group of high level coaches that uh, we were very open and sharing and transparent in things that were and weren't working in our academies. It was very collaborative. Um, and it was a group of people who, on the whole, were able to put their own agendas and their own priorities aside and were looking at what collectively can we do to make British basketball better and to look after the 150 young people in, in this program and, and to enhance their, their opportunities. And the, yeah, th those days were great. Um, and through that, obviously competition and appropriate competition for, for the kids came up. So back before, before it happened, you'd have most of the academies were linked to a men's team. The, the better kids were playing men's basketball on the weekend depending on the level of that club some were playing more minutes some were playing less minutes there were more and less opportunities for them but they, they were all all were linked to men's programs um in some way and then playing under 18 basketball but the drop from men's under 18s was seen as as quite a big thing um especially because because they were all playing men's on the weekend the under 18 competition was diluted because none of the best kids played in it um and so obviously through that, there were a group of people, which uh, Nick Drain, I think, was a big drive to, to really get it off the ground. And uh, you got involved quite quickly, obviously, with that, with well, I think it was you and Nick together, basically, that, that, that really pitched it. This idea started coming of creating our own separate Elite Academies League. And the I think why it was successful early on was, was two things. Uh, I don't even remember how I got involved, by the way. I don't, I don't know who asked me. At some point, I, I got involved with, uh, you mean, I, in in my day job, I do I work in a school, but I do a lot of logistics is what I do, and, and numbers and organization and whatever else and stuff. So that aspect got brought in. Um, so what what came about is that we had, a, we had a small group of us. We had about four or five other coaches um, from the league who had agreed to kind of be a committee to, to sound things off with. We had what became you and I, largely, that, that you doing the promotion side and me doing the logistics side of uh, working together to coordinate the league. But everything, any big change we did, all came from ACE meetings. And it came from the coaches talking together and saying, this is what's missing, or this is what's needed, or this is the next step that, that's there. And then we, and then you and I would look at how we actually put that in, into place. And if you go back to, to when I was talking before about regulation and, and buy-in and, and how you get people to do stuff, it then made it very easy to manage the league because even if we made a decision that an individual coach didn't agree with, they were okay with it. They, they, they didn't agree with the decision, but they were okay with how it was done because they knew the whole thing was trying to put rules in place to support what they had asked us to do and what collectively we believed in believed in was right. Um, and and I don't I genuinely don't four or five years we probably did it together. I don't remember a single actual difficult conversation with, with any coach that I ever had. There were and what I mean by that, there were difficult uh, decisions to communicate and things that you knew people wouldn't agree with, but never where it went beyond with beyond a professional disagreement and under, but understanding of what happened because there was this collective buy-in to, to what we were doing, um, and I think once we got that, it let us really move things forward. So you mean, and it, when people see what it got to in, in year one, teams were keeping their own stats on the bench, and and there'd be all kinds of interesting disagreements over the accuracy of of those and whatever else and stuff like that, but. It was the first. It was the first time you had a league with complete stats though provided, and, and that we were able to to detail that. The the work you did with with social media and with video and so on 
was something we had never seen in British basketball at, at including at, at pro level probably at that point that the level as far as consistently across the whole league what was happening and I think like and there were probably lots of mistakes we made as well which one of the reasons I think it worked especially as a startup is that we had basketball leagues permission to do this but we were sitting outside of them and so we had license to try things and we didn't have red tape to go through which and i don't mean that in a critical way like any organization needs to have procedures and so on because we were outside of it we could kind of take it and we we gave that protection to be that if something went wrong it, it was actually on eabl and you and me ultimately that would, would have to take on the chin that, that that went wrong um so the those being able to try things out i think was a huge strength and then as the league's profile grew i think the best decision we made was then what you would hear from 16 year olds wasn't i want to play a i want to go to an a school it was i want to play eabl because the, the league we'd achieved that priority and so we then made it we talked over and over about how do we get the message out better to kids that what an a school is and all the things that it provides with overall care with snc with physio etc and stuff like that and so the ace coaches collectively made the decision and this is what an example of what i talked before being brave to make a decision that might hurt a few people in the short term but is better for the long term to go to ace only in, in the abl because i guess what i should have said for, for context for everyone else listening there were probably 30 teams in the ABL to begin with. So as anybody who was competitively good enough, didn't matter, you might not practice, you might never have a single practice, but you had these 12 guys doing one course in the evening in adult ed that meant they could play for your school and went, great, you're in the ABL because you're good enough. Um, and so when we made the, the decision, and, and it was like, there, I, I still, there were long, long discussions on that day uh, about what to do. And you mean, again, where it was, club zone school owned. you weren't in you weren't there that day if those that was the teams having the discussion because the coaches are collectively working together to to look at what we want to do and, and and i think that was massive and i think over for a couple of years after that you really had the best players 90 odd percent of the of the best players in the country were at an a school playing the abl and the last thing I'd say why I loved coaching in it and why it was so good was because it was under 19 instead of under 18, the players were a year older, physically, mentally mature. All the best kids played in it. And it was the only place all the best junior kids played because on the weekend they were playing a mixture of division one men, division two men, under 18. But this is where outside of probably a few Barkin Abbey kids, even from the start, all the best kids played EABL. And that's where you would see them all, you would play against the best and really be able to measure yourself. Because of how we ramped expectations up every year, the video and the stats that were available, you could scout properly. You could you could do everything, you could prepare properly, you could debrief, you could give the kids, I mean, like we said, you would have to get to, we would always talk to kids about this, you're gonna have to get to a very, very high level in your professional career to have the professional experience you're getting in the ABL right now. And that, again, if you look back to what I said about my shock when I moved here from Canada and the lack of professionalism, that there, there, was this, uh, there was a stretch, and lots of that is still happening right now, where EABL teams are more professional than everything outside of BBL, probably. And probably more professional than some BBL. There's maybe a few Division One teams, like stuff like what Solent does is, is phenomenal, obviously, behind the scenes. Um, but yeah, these kids are getting a very, very high level professional experience out of it. Um, so yeah, it, it's without a doubt the the collaborative work we did together, one of the proudest things that 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 I've been involved with. And so what do you think has happened since? Like, I, I'm not even sure the year that, I don't even know what year, you stopped the same year that I stopped, it was the yeah, same sort yeah, of year. So it, it yeah. was a couple of years ago, three years ago, two, three years ago, something like that, maybe, maybe a little more, I'm not even sure, I need to double check. But what do you think has happened since? And what would you say about, um, you know, the state of the EABL now? Okay. Um, I guess probably first thing, you're, you're happy for me to openly answer this because it obviously involves you as well as part of this. Yeah, yeah, I've got, I've yeah, got, yeah. I've got no problem. Just, just, just making sure. So BE made a decision 
at some point to take it back in house and um very, very professionally and whatever else and stuff like that not in an inappropriate way but we we were both po- politely politely asked told whatever that that they were going to take it in house and thank you for what we've done and, and again they recognize both of us and so i have no no qualms about any of that and ultimately that's their decision as the, the federation but they they chose to take it um in house and i think um what the the negative impact that's had and i don't it's um what's the right way to phrase it I can't think of the right word to phrase it like it's this isn't a criticism anyway it this is what's going to happen if it goes back in house EABL was a passion for you and I. I. I don't know how many hours we spent on the phone back and forth each week. Even, you mean, the amount of debate we would sometimes have over player of the week and just trying to make sure that we got the right person within that. And 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 any, any difficult decision we had to make was never just straight look at a rule book. It was putting everything in context and we'd go back and forth with each other and we'd bring other coaches into it and, and we would talk things through. B aren't set up to do things on that scale. EABL is just one of many, many leagues that they run. And uh, they openly set their structures up. And again, it's not right or wrong. This is their their choice federation where EABL isn't on a pedestal. EABL is one of their competitions. And it's it's thought of slightly higher than some of the others. Like and it's it's grouped with NBL one and WNBL one and so on but it still is one of, of their competitions. Nobody has uh, uh, nobody has, and nobody should be thinking about EABL as much as BE as you or I would have been when we were running it because it is just an element within what they do. And I think that uh, that level of care that, that went into it back then um, is what isn't replicated by BE and, and can't be. And I think that's where it's, it's lost a little bit of its uniqueness. It's lost a little bit um, of what set it apart from the other leagues. Um, and I think ultimately, uh, my belief when they took it in house, instead of insisting that other leagues were brought up to the standard of EABL, EABL standards were lowered to make the gap smaller between them and, and other leagues. And um, and yeah, I, do I think EABL is a good thing? Still, yes, of course. I, I think it's a very, very good thing compared to, to what's out there. Is it as good as it was? I'm, I'm biased, obviously, but but I don't think um, I don't think it is as special as it once was. Do you think there are simple changes? Like the thing is, right? I'm not privy to any of these conversations anymore. I'm not in any of the meetings. I don't, I don't know what. I don't exactly know what goes on behind the scenes and stuff like that. Do you think there are easy wins that, um, or, or easy changes that could be made uh, to the EABL structure or to, to the competition, to the rules uh, that would make things back as like good again or, or change things? Like, do you think there are easy wins that could be had? I, I think the, the biggest one for me, and obviously difficult in the current environment where everything's remote meetings, but um, I don't, the ACE meetings don't have all the coaches there anymore because it's, it's now part of the academics and so on, and it's there's different people there. I think the the, but even when they are there, we don't get enough time to talk about like we used to. Uh, the, the ultimate development of this collective group of, of young young men and women, um, and I think the biggest thing for me would be, like I know there's an EABL and WABL rep on the com- competitions com- committee. But back then, we weren't even part of the competitions committee. We, the ABL and WA rep were the competition. Um, so I, I think being able to get back to a situation where, A, there's time for those coaches to talk collaboratively and to, uh, and to have strong voices in the room. And, and that's where that was by no means just me. I mean, there, there were a group of coaches at that stage like Lloyd Gardner played a huge part, Jackson Gibbons, Matt Shaw, um, who was involved at the start, Nick Drain, obviously. Um, I'm probably missing one or two that, again, were really good at challenging each other at this isn't about your program. This this is about the collective good. And really talk with the league and, and holding each other accountable that way. 
So both having those opportunities to have coaches talk with strong voices to, to keep it about what's best for everybody. And then those conversations having real and meaningful impact in the decisions that are made in the administration of the league. And that because there's extra layers within it now, even when some of those discussions occur, they probably don't come through as uh, as purely, as clearly as we'd like them to in, in what ultimately is done. So I think that that to me would be the, the biggest win or the quickest win. The other big thing that I, that I want to talk about is the, the BDM, the basketball development model. Um, yeah, I'd be interested, like, so so my understanding is that the, uh, it was led by it was Stuart Kett, the basketball England CEO when he when he came in. Um, there was a lot of a lot of research that was done uh, to try and understand, you know, what why English basketball essentially has not reached its potential. What what the issues are, and uh, the BDM was formed where essentially it had state, various stakeholders from the game in in various different expert groups around different topics, whether it's officiating or, or player development or I don't know whatever it might be. Um, yeah. And everyone come around the table to try and essentially work out a plan to to to, to yeah. grow things. And you were involved with that. Uh, yeah, I'd be interested to kind of hear, like, first of all, whether or not my description is correct, like whether or not that's kind of on the money, and and then two, like, what ultimately happened with it? Because I kind of feel like it just fizzled out and nothing really has been implemented. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, your, your description is pretty good. The only thing I'd add to it is each of those groups, and I think it was one of the best things they did. There were, I don't know, about 10 subgroups. Every subgroup was comprised of both Basketball England staff and external experts, for lack of a better word. But but people from the basketball community, mostly UK, but some foreign as well, who, uh, who were seen to be knowledgeable within that area. And when we had the, the first meetings of the BDM, it is the... The most positive I've been by far that change that we had a chance to, to change something because this was the if you remember back in in the 2010s we had two before Stuart was CEO there were two big vision statements that came out I think one by British basketball and, and one by B that were just what everyone knew Here, here's the six big things we need to get better at like yeah ev, ev, and no detail no whereas the BDM was was very much originally set up to change things not to talk about vision but to talk about detail and how are we actually going to achieve we all know what the vision is what are we actually going to do how are we going to make this happen um and ivan uh yeah i think i'm okay to say this ivan at, at the one of the things we we're asked is how do we get this wrong and my answer in front of everyone at that first meeting was we announce a big big vision and big structure and don't actually do anything and that that that's what will kill us with the basketball community um so i was involved in the competitions group so having obviously done this stuff with the abl and, and and that logistics background um we so like i said the, the vision i was sold on the structure and how it was put together and i, I think we had two two like big group get togethers that I was involved with where like the, everything was pulled together, both like good, well run, uh, really, really strong belief in it, work happening behind the scenes in between those. Um, that's where when I talk about Canada, Finland, Germany before that, that was the time I did real research into those and, and talking to people from those federations to try and pick their brains on, uh, on what they'd done. And, and again, a very, the whole approach to BDM was looking at things like that, being realistic of let's not go to Serbia, let's see what they do because we can't replicate that culture. That they're at a starting point that none of that we can't start from. Let's not look at Spain. Let's not look at America. Let's look at countries who have found a way to go from being not seen as as a basketball powerhouse and have developed themselves to 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 get to that point. Um, and for a variety of reasons. Um, it then just started to fizzle and everything slowed down and nothing seemed to be happening at uh, at the same time uh, as everything started to fizzle out is obviously when uh, I stopped coaching national teams and in a, a in a difficult situation I chose to walk away from it feeling not that I wasn't 
wanted anymore within the national team setup. Uh, at the same time, not long after that, we obviously had the, the ABLs. Just for context for people, in terms of national team stuff, yep. you, you were coaching England under-15s and you'd obviously been assisting England under-16s as well, right? Um, yeah, so I was head coach. So I did 16s first for a few years, uh, then came away when I had children, and then was head coach of the England 15s for five seasons. Um, and, yeah. Um, so BDM is fizzling. I've uh, walked away from national teams. I've EABL stuff was starting to come out that maybe they're going to bring it back in house. Uh, I was also recommended by the clubs to be a director of BE and was uh, rejected by BE of being put forward because I didn't fit the uh, I didn't meet the criteria that they hadn't published. Um, and so with everything going on, uh, I chose to walk away from the BDM at, at that point also. Um, which was really difficult because it was something I thought was actually going to make a difference. Uh, in, in hindsight, I have no regrets walking away because nothing's actually happened um, since then. It in B will say that small things have changed, and yes, there have been some changes that I know were things were talked about then, but nothing on the scale of what was talked about, and nothing on the uh, the joined up thinking across all these different areas that was talked about, and we're now three, four years at least probably since, since it happened. So, um, yeah, it, it's disappointing, uh, but it's something that's out of my control. And um, Just a typical same old story of, of, of basketball in this country. Um, when you talk about the, the scale of the, the changes that you were potentially talking about and the things that you wanted to, you wanted to see happen, what were those changes? What were the things that were being discussed that you, that you think – if they were done, it would really make a positive impact on the game here? Uh, you mean a lot of things we've touched on. Co coach education being completely revamped, coach licensing being completely revamped, those being done jointly in the way we talked about, about educating people, but at the same time, slowly building regulation. Uh, competitions becoming, as we did with the ABL, standard-driven, different levels of competition with different standards attached. Again, not creating something unmanageable in year one, setting a standard in year one, a slightly higher standard in year two, a slightly higher standard in, in year three, but things that were properly checked. So things that weren't a paperwork exercise, that teams say, yes, we do all this stuff and none of it happens, systems to make sure that, like we had within the ABL, that what was said was was actually happening. Um, a... Uh, Re so those being big things, revamping, looking at the talent pathway and looking at how we keep more kids involved at younger ages and how we build towards national teams, how we look at exit routes for for our kids, both at earlier kids who are ready to go earlier to the small group that there is and kids who at the end of high school, what what they're going to do um, within stuff. But I, I, I think those first ones I started with coach development, coach education, and using, same way we did the email, using the competition structure as the vehicle to enforce those other things that really matter. That it's not the competition that matters, but the competition, what people care about. So if you get the competition right and you make the, the standards that you need to get into that competition, what needs to happen, people will do it because they want to play at that level and um, trying to align those, those two things. Um, I mean, there are other aspects within BDM that I didn't interact with as much. Um, so there may have been other stuff within there, like for officiating, for example, I, I didn't have a, uh, just my role didn't cross over with them a lot. So again, there, there'd be other stuff within it that was talked about that all, and all these groups were on similar trajectories to us, putting some, some real detailed stuff together uh, of what we can do. Um, so yeah. And so just to, to, to bring it all full circle back to back to the club, um, yeah. you did you mentioned earlier that kind of in two, three years ago, you kind of decided to go a different direction in terms of what you were doing with the club. Like, what would you say about where the club is now? What was that change of direction? Uh, and I guess, how are you approaching it all? Yeah, so we, I remember when we first were starting out, uh, and a few coaches will laugh here in this, I've repeated this line to them as, as their clubs went on similar journeys. Rick Baldridge, uh, I was coaching England with, and he said, yeah, it's all fun until you get to, to the top. 
And I kind of went, you're, like, you're crazy. That's that's why we do it. That's the whole point. We want our men to get to the point where they're close to professional or whatever else and stuff like that. And yeah, he was right. Uh, it stops being fun uh, because it then is the more people you're paying, the more it becomes about managing egos, managing money, managing sponsors. And it goes away from what we've always been about, developing players and developing coaches. Um, and so we were in Division One for a good few years. Um, and then it just started to get, we'd, the balance you're always trying to get of how much we keep our Kent connection versus how competitive we are. And so we, we got it wrong. We fell in the trap of bringing in too many players who had no history with the club that were just there to play for us. And then they disappear and there's no, and there's not, and you've alienated local people because you've chosen, chosen external people over them. And, and so we got that wrong. And so we got to the point where uh, Lorraine and I both felt way too much of our time was, it was all our time was spent on the Division One team and we weren't being able to spend the time with, with the juniors and the elite development that, that we really cared about. And so we wanted to look at a moving on from that. We'd always worked closely with, with Lloyd and Bark and Abbey that we'd, we'd had... Um, Ricky Broadmoor, Dan Gerard, there's a few others I've missed that, that we've always had some of their players who in year 14 would come play for us um, because back then Barkin only had Division 3. So so guys who could travel would, would come down and play Division 1 for us. And so when we were really struggling, we, we talked we talked with them about actually merging. And, and we put a... Because uh, again, people don't realise, they think Kent and London actually where we were based in Kent and where Barking was, uh, Barking's only a 10 minute difference drive to Medway than Canterbury is. So uh, as far as being where we were, so we put a real plan together and, and Northfleet, obviously other academy sits right in between uh, um, Barking and Medway. So we put this plan together uh, of how we can work together, how we can merge and actually make a real difference to basketball development, boys and girls through that, um, through the Thames corridor, basically through through the, the south side of the Thames, um, and so we we merged with them. Um, we couldn't officially merge mid season, so we knew that. So we we uh, we worked with them for Division One, and, and basically their their guys became our Division One team to begin with. But this much bigger plan was 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 the vision of it. Um, ultimately, that vision wasn't approved, so we we never were able to fully merge with them. So we, we tried for a couple of years and tried different structures and, and different ways of still having the Division One plan in place, but but trying to merge the rest. And a couple of years down the road, it, it we gave up. Basically, it became apparent we weren't gonna gonna be able to do what we wanted to do, and the the barriers in place didn't make the rest of the projects we wanted to viable or, or worth it in that way. So uh, that's when we we. Um, Asked for B to pass the pass the Division One license or franchise, whatever the right word is, um, over to Barking, and it, and it separated from us. Um, so the club now is fully focused on back to what we started, um, except for the semi pro bit. Our, our focus is elite development of boys and girls now, um, all the way through. That our men's team is basically our juniors playing men's basketball, and make sure they get opportunities to play there. Um, and I guess that the two changes from that first bit would be girls is now a big priority for us. So we had there been a season this year, we, we have under 12 and under 14 National League girls and, and building from the bottom. And we have we have over 100 mini ballers that, uh, uh, yeah, my, my daughter apparently should have been the business brain behind the club that, that starting mini ballers was, was apparently a pretty good idea and, and was something that once you get going, is pretty good. So uh so we now have a, a much bigger participation section to the club, both mini ballers, but also trying to keep more kids involved under 14 and 16 um, who aren't necessarily at a, a Premier National League standard yet. Right, time. So we're going to do some. We're going to do some just some quick fire questions just to yep. f- finish off with. Uh, starting with, I, I think I'm going to know the answer to half of these, but we'll, we'll ask them anyway. But um, the the best coach, favorite coach that you, that you've been around. Yeah, I mean Dave Smart obviously is uh, is is the simple one, um, and then in so for more in my time in the UK, uh, 
Yvonne Cuesta, who who was at Canterbury Academy for three years with me from Spain, uh, most fun. Uh, I've had coaching as a head coach, without a doubt, working with him. So there, I'll, I'll give one unpredictable answer at least. And then uh, best British junior player that you've ever seen? Yeah, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, 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 got, it's got to be Ryan. So, um, well, who yeah. would you take second after Ryan? It's a good question. Uh Ones I've played some part in or seen a lot of, I'd say either uh, Josh Steele when he was playing for our men. Um, so when, when we had the, the merge with Bark and Abbey and what we achieved that year with him, just as far as um, so intelligent beyond his years uh, and just the, all the intangibles that he brought uh, as a young player. And then Carl Weedle. Um, so when, when Carl was with the England under 15s, a, a year young, it was, uh, his mindset and you I mean his skill set was nowhere at that point, but his mindset and his drive and his competitiveness and all those intangibles that I value so much that, that we've talked about, he's probably the, he's the British kid who's embodied those, um, the best I'd say. What's your favorite basketball memory? Uh, that's a good question. Um, favorite basketball memory. The Co- Copenhagen under fifteen national team Copenhagen tournament my last year because I already knew I was stepping down at the end of it, so nobody else did. But I knew that was that was the end of my England coaching. So. Uh, winning the tournament with a group of players and staff that I loved w- would be up there. Um, the the first academy team that James and I coached with, with Cleo Irving, with, with Dizzy, and, and the success we had when nobody knew who we were uh, as being a brand new academy and, and making Final Fours and three competitions with them would be up there. Um, and then just my, my overall time at Carleton. Um, and just so many different moments within it, I'd say, are, are the three. The best uh, individual uh, British basketball performance that you've ever witnessed? I see, I'm trying to think if I've seen a really standout one live. Um, no, nothing. Nothing comes to mind. I, actually, the in a funny way, so when when Ryan was being recruited by the Spanish clubs, um, we we played Ipswich in an under sixteen game who had Lee Green in, and it, I apologize to any players listening and eight other guys on the court who had no clue what they were doing besides those two. Uh, so actually, w- watching the two of them with Spanish coaches sitting there scouting them in this horrible gym, uh, and just watching these two genuine bigs go at it with just hoping the ball got across half court so somebody could pass it to one of them at each end was that, that that's one of the, the, not quite your question, but that's probably the game that sticks that's out that. most in my memory. Perfect. And then uh, the future, what's, what's in the future for you? Like, and, and also, I guess the, the club, like next three to five years, um, what are you hoping to do? So cl- club, easy answer. You mean what, what Adam and Billy are doing is phenomenal right now. It is just to, to solidify and improve what we're doing. We uh, we feel we've got a real niche of taking players at Academy who are slightly below the radar when they come to us and developing them to, to have opportunities to go to the States, to play with national teams and so on. And the, through the work we've done with mini ballers and, and through the club teams have a, a much better base coming through our own club. So just yet yeah, continuing to be what we believe are one of the leading EABL programs with good quality coaching all the way through the juniors and and the girl replicating that with the girls um for the club for me I don't know I, I kind of keep flipping around being honest I keep flipping around right now I've started doing some coach mentoring this year which I've really enjoyed uh I think not not doing national teams not doing EABL uh selfishly there's a gap for me I, I enjoy being involved in in work with other people in that way so it's trying to figure out what I can balance with work and and being involved in in supporting wider British basketball in in whatever way that that works out. 
Perfect, perfect place to leave it. Jesse, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, again, apologies for our re-recording of the 40 minutes we did yesterday. <laughs> um, still feel incredibly bad about it, but uh, yeah, it was it was worth the wait. And uh, yeah, hopefully we will catch up at some point soon when all this corona stuff has passed um, and we'll have to do a part two in the future. Thanks again for having me.